North and South Part 2 is kinda in the same position that Smoke and Shadow was, in the sense that Part 1 set up some pretty interesting beats, but they won't add up to much unless this part capitalizes on them. Smoke and Shadow kinda let me down in that department, but with this comic centering around some more fleshed out characters and their home dynamics, I can see it working a lot better. Let's find out. So we start off with not the reaction of Hakoda kissing that lady, but instead with Hakoda leading a small party to Gilak's hideout under the Fire Nation raiding ship. Wait, is that a female Water Tribe warrior? Season 1 Paku, can I get a ruling on this? Season 1 Paku's gotta get with the times, man. The vibe is a little weird, the head of the country leading the search on the insurgents, shouldn't he have, like, people for this? Anyway, they find the hole in the hallway, and away they go. Turns out the entire crew of them cleared out, figuring that Hakoda would come after them, and while searching for a clue on where they could've gone, they find a message. Which, as far as I can decipher, reads, I'll friggin' show you. We move now to Katara and Sokka being shown around some sort of facility that the Northerners set up that looks, like, strikingly modern. Like, more modern than anything you even really see in Korra. And once again, it's not even stylized, so it looks really weird. I'm surprised this panel doesn't get as much hate as the forklift, honestly. These two are really excited to show off their work, and Sokka's way into it too, but Katara's not even listening. Katara, of course, is still really rattled about seeing her dad kissing Melina, and Sokka, trying to be mature about it, is like, well, dad's a grown man, and yeah, well, okay, you're right, it sucks. But, you know, Katara's just upset that it has to be this chick. She's so not right for her dad, clearly. But Sokka continues to try to be mature and says, hey, dad gets to choose, that's his right. But Katara doesn't seem at all concerned about how Hakoda feels, she's worried about how she she feels. She fears the possibility of them getting married and Melina being her mother. Anyway, sorry, no one was listening. What does this place actually do? Melina says they found a huge deposit of oil under the ice and they're going to extract it. Oh god, they're gonna start fracking in the Avatar world? These guys really are evil, what the hell? They say this will really get this place on track, which Katara once again doesn't take kindly to. But Malik, Eilis, says this is the biggest oil deposit in the world, maybe in the solar system, who knows? He says with this deposit we can put machines all over the place and then non-benders will finally be equal to benders. You don't don't get a Katara because you're a filthy, water-bending charlatan. Katara says, oh, I just never thought of non-benders as lesser than myself, I guess. But Sokka has. This is a beat that was lightly touched on with Satoru in his factory, in The Rift, which is making this book and The Rift even more samey. Maybe they'll lean further into this idea to separate things? Sokka says as much here too, this is just like earthen fire refineries, this is great. And it turns out this outfit is in partnership with Satoru, wow, small world I guess. They even got a forklift, okay, I guess it's kind of funny that Sokka's way into it at the expense of the reader, probably. Anyway, so Toph shows up, then it's festival time, I guess. Wow, look at all the lights. Okay, okay, I'm kidding. Toph got sent here as a representative for Satoru's company, so she had to get a cool winter outfit, and honestly, not bad. But since Toph is in Antarctica right now, that means she has to wear shoes, or, you know, risk losing her feet altogether, so Toph is seriously nerfed in this environment. Toph says, sup, we're fucking partners in crime now, huh? And these two say they're hosting that shindig tonight as a celebration of them teaming up with Earth and Fire. Oh, really? You're throwing a city-wide party for that? Well, well, I mean, I've heard and made worse excuses to drink. They want Katara and Sokka to come as the guests of honor, and Sokka's like, fuck yeah, I don't know, Katara, this lady, like, seems pretty dope to me, maybe you should give her a chance. Katara says, I will not be doing that. So yeah, wow, look at this party, they got tents, they got a stage, they got stairs, they got everything, wow. Sokka and Toph spot that hammer game you see at fairs sometimes, and Toph says, this is where I do my best fucking work, let's get paid. This is, of course, a reference to the scamming montage in the episode The Runaway, where Toph cheated and won easily. So they go off to have some fun, but Katara's not in the fun-having mood still. Paku walks up, though, to keep her from falling into lonely despair, and introduces his two students, Siku and Sura. Shura? Sura? I feel like Shura hits the ear better. I'm going with Shura. You'll also notice there are two girls, which up until Katara showed up, he was way against. Paku immediately takes up praising Katara, saying that she could be the finest waterbender in the world, and by the way, you know who taught her, right? Ha <laughs> ha! But the two girls say they're not having a good experience training, because they're not waterbenders. Oh, weird. And then they run off. Oh, very weird. Katara says, oh, very weird. And Paku says, yeah, 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 we found him a little bit ago in a tiny village. They're actually nuts at waterbending, but they don't want anyone to know it. They won't do it around anyone but each other. They're younger than Katara was at the start of the show, and they're way better than she was. These kids could be like waterbending messiahs, but for whatever reason, they don't want anyone to think they can do it. Meanwhile, Hakoda doesn't have time to party. He's outside the city, keeping an eye out for any attack from Gilak. And good thing too, because they're here, and they're the ones looking to party. They've even got a huge drill. A drill? Preposterous. There's never been any enormous drills in Avatar, there's no precedent for this, what the hell? Gilak dons the black wolf helmet, symbolizing him as the leader of this troop, just as Hakoda was the only one wearing a black helmet on the day of Black Sun. Katara goes to visit her dad rather than enjoy the festival, and asks if he wants some company. Hakoda's on edge over here, he's even starting to have detailed face. He figures that with all that's happened in the last couple days, an attack on this festival is very likely. They have a seat, and Hakoda can tell something is bothering Katara, and he knows it's Melina. And he apologizes for not telling them about her before they got jump scared the other night. Katara 
Sarah projects onto her dad, asking him if he's sure he's ready, but really telling him that she's not ready. And she tells him that Melina doesn't get the South Pole. Melina epitomizes the feeling Katara has been having since she arrived back home. The feeling of her own cultural identity being washed away by the Northerners. And now, a Northerner is taking the one thing that represents home and safety and family to where the most, her father. It seems everything is trending towards Katara not feeling at home here, and this is the worst part of it all. And Katara continues to sort of lash out here, saying that she doesn't trust Molina and thinks she might be up to something. And Hakoda and I are like, come on, like, I get she's robbing you the wrong way, but you're seeing evil in her because she's threatening your idea of home. Which is very understandable, but at the same time, this is your dad's happiness you're talking about. But Katara doubles down. She says, what if you're blinded by your feelings and you can't see how evil she really is? Jesus, Katara. Hakoda says, listen, you know what it feels like to be in love, right? That's what I got. And oh, speak of the devil, look who's coming in hot. Katara's like, ah! And Ang's like, ah! He gives Katara the rundown about what happened with Zuko and asks for a kiss, which Katara says, ah, maybe pump the brakes around my dad. You know, I'm trying to be the change I want to see in the world. And Ang's told Hakoda is head chieftain now too. Man, good vibes all around. Ang asks what's up with all the muscle outside the city. You need some help? I'm the Avatar and shit. I got this cape. I'm looking tight as hell. I'll throw down. I'll die for you, Hakoda. Hakoda says, no, 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 we're good. Go enjoy the festival. Katara asks Sang, hey, my dad's always been like the super homie to you, right? And Ang's like, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And Katara says, yeah, maybe I should take a page out of his book. That's nice. I like that after seeing her dad so graciously accept Ang, she gets a second perspective on her father's relationship. So we catch up with Sokka and Toph, and it turns out Sokka's got a fucking arm on him. Look at him go. He's farming Toph stuffed animals. She's got a badger mole, she got a penguin, leopard caribou, a purple pentapus, and I think this is probably that one weird bird lizard from that one shot that we didn't get a name for. And a flying lemur. Damn, Sokka's going to work here. Katara picks Molina out of the crowd and says, hey, wait up. Listen, man, I just wanted to say thanks for- oh, that's Momo, my bad. Thanks for inviting Sokka and I. We're both having a lot of fun. Molina's really pumped to hear that, but is even more pumped to see the Avatar. Haha, <laughs> you didn't think the Avatar would show up when you set up all these cups, did you, you fucking simpletons? Katara says, yeah, you want to meet him? And Molina says, yes, she would like that. She would like that quite a bit, actually. She gets pulled away by her brother, though. Looks like they gotta make an announcement. Sokka's still absolutely crushing the carnival game, and oh wait, no, he did get a flying lemur stuffed animal after all. Finally, Momo is not alone in this cold world. Sokka tries to get the polar bear dog, but I guess his victory's turned over. He's back at square one, so he gets what's probably a meadow vole, that little rat thing Iroh chilled with that one time. There's also this weird creature that might be Koizilla, maybe? Molina's announcement is about the oil they're going to extract and how they're going to make the South even shinier and even newer. That way, the rest of the world will finally respect you. Everyone's like, oh, great. But hold up, we got incoming. Toph feels something underground. Yo, Team Avatar heads on to Swivel here. We're probably gonna have to do some Team Avatar shit. Molina, unaware of impending doom, says, Toph, why don't you come up here and say a few words? And Toph says, all right, everybody fucking leave or die. And oh yeah, here they come with the drill and everything. Wow, crazy two-page spread of these guys just chilling on top of the drill. All right. Oh, look, they got the briefcase from last issue, too. Gilak starts his own speech, appealing to the older folks, saying we grew up together, appealing to the soldiers, saying that we fought a war together, appealing to those who eat food, saying that we've eaten food together. You know, I've been round. I'm all about this place. But these two assholes never did any of that. They're here to subjugate us. They're here to destroy us. They found oil under our land, and they're gonna steal it for the north. Oh, wait, really? Damn, you got some intel I don't, Gilak? Oh, wait, he does, actually. The briefcase. I forgot. The north is planning to make the south a colony of the north because according to these plans, the north will decide how the oil is extracted, what it's used for, and where it's shipped, despite it being southern land. Now, I don't know if that's the definition of a colony, Gilak, but I will agree, you are getting a raw deal here. Huh, this guy actually might have some pretty good footing for this argument, actually. Hold on. But Molina says that's not the plan at all. But, I mean, you know, it was at one point, actually. But now that we've spent time here, we can see the south is ready for that responsibility. But Malik says, what's with this shit? I don't think that at all. I never cancelled any plan. The new plan is the old plan. The North will be in charge. Oh shit, Malik is the nefarious one, Katara. You just missed. Malik says that guy in the quote, ridiculous tribal outfit is correct. Everything he's saying. This oil means a lot to everyone, not just your quote again, little backward society. Oh my god, Malik isn't just evil. He's a fucking racist. Jesus. Malik is confirming all of the fears Katara has been harboring. He's even referring to the South as not an actual civilization. His tirade is cut short by Melina, who immediately tells the crowd that her and her brother are stepping down and leaving the South Pole in the morning. Wow, weird that Malik just had a complete meltdown like this, right? But this is exactly what Gilak wanted, not just for Katara's fears to be confirmed, but also for his own prejudices to be confirmed as well. It's fucking go time now, and who even knows where the crowd is going to side thanks to Malik, so now they've got a ton of ravenous, and I mean, according to Malik's invective, justified feeling Northmen running at them with the sole purpose of probably beating slash hacking them to death. So the construction goons kick it into gear, and so do Team Avatar. Aang thinks aloud, well, I mean, they probably don't deserve to die. Katara and Aang are on security detail while Toph and Sokka are gonna try to de-escalate things. The new 
news reaches Hakoda that Gilak is already in the town square. No idea how that happened, but we gotta book it and go handle this shit. Ang says, I got the troops. It's light work for a guy like me. So Katara flies over the soldiers, and I audibly sigh. Here we go. You ready? <sighs> One slips through, though, and launches a spear at Molina's snow wall, but he is soundly trounced by some water tentacle arms Katara whipped up. Malik says, thanks, Katara. I knew you weren't like the rest of these people. And Katara says, you're all driving me crazy. Here we go. You ready? You're all driving me crazy! Oh, and then she gets dummied by this giant snow pillar. It's the construction bozos again, and it seems like they firmly side with Malik on these matters. I knew they had a strange hulkish goon look to them. What did I tell you? So now it's gonna be a weird three-way fight. The construction goons, who are trying to protect Molina and Malik, and also fight the southern insurgents. Gilak, who is trying to hurt Melina Malik and thus the construction team, and Team Avatar who are trying to protect Melina Malik and also fight Gilak and the construction team. Everyone got it? All right, good. That old man is back with his impossible to decipher riddles. Katara's like, not this asshole again. Oh, I guess what he was saying before was that the South was actually the snow rat, not the North. I took it as if the rat was the North because he is very clearly anti-North. But no, he says the metaphor is actually supposed to read like the South is the snow rat and despite the Northerners hospitalities and kinship, they won't ever see you as anything more than the snow rat. Okay, I guess that does read better than what I thought it was. He asks after seeing this, after hearing what Malik had to say, will Katara now support Gilak and his cause? Katara holds steadfast though, she will not sway. Old man says, damn, oh well, never mind. Uh, ever hear of chi blocking? And Katara says, yes, actually, a good friend of mine. Oh god, you've chi blocked me. And even Aang over here is getting overwhelmed. There's too many of them. Two get close enough to tie up his arms and a bit to keep him from air blasting everyone all over the damn place. And they aim to skewer him with a giant drill. Man, that would be a grim way for someone to go and Avatar. But in their overconfidence, they have forgotten that it is possible to bend with your legs. So Ang flips both the drill and himself over in one quick motion, and then sends these two soldiers flying as well. I'm glad Ang is still appropriately nigh untouchable. That's really good. I was worried last comic they were gonna start dumbing down his ability in combat after he breathed in some dust and got kicked in the back that one time. So Toph and Sokka see the construction goons taking on the soldiers, and they figure, eh, that's probably a good use of our time. Toph sees Soonjay using some earth gauntlets and feels an insatiable urge to one-up him, so that's easily done. Whoa, Toph figured out punching too. Her and Mei Man, they're really a step ahead. These soldiers see they're about to be fighting Sokka, so they also try to turn him to their side. But Sokka, just like Katara, says forget that. So it's a boomerang showdown. Wow, never thought I'd see the day. Sokka, with his mastery over boomerang trajectory, skillfully dodges both of the southerners' weapons and takes them both out with a single throw. Now I'm just saying, this is a bladed boomerang. Looking how it hit this guy, it should have probably really messed him up. And yeah, it should have probably messed Combustion Man up too. Back with Katara, her arms are chi blocked, but oh, God, she's pulled out the weird kick move, snow variation. Wow, good thing that scroll had that move on it. Good thing I don't need my arms to waterbend. I mean, I wouldn't go that far. Like, you can, but this is the first kick move I've ever seen you do, Katara. Oh, well, old guy's defeated, and this officer is gonna take care of him, so Ang and Katara are gonna go find Hakoda and give him a hand. Malik and Melina have made it out of the city, but that seems somehow even more dangerous in my head, and oh, God, everyone's figured out punching. What, new tech just dropped and everyone's trying it out? Gilak catches up with the two kids he's stationed outside the city, whose orders must have been, hey, if you see them running out of the city gates, just, uh, punch them. Molina tries to plead, saying that they'll leave, but the southerners aren't having it. The kids are chi blockers too, taught by that old man, I suspect. And Molina, now totally helpless, pleads once more, but Gilak says no. I'm probably gonna horribly chop you to death now, I figure. Here it comes! I'm gonna do it! Yeah! Oh no, wait, Hakoda stopped him just in time, actually. Gilak says, oh good, you're here. I have proof that these assholes were gonna- but Hakoda cuts him off, saying, yeah, 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 screw the south over and bring it under northern control, I know. So Gilak's very confused, and asks why he's defending her then, because that's not the plan anymore, dumbass. Hakoda brings up Zuko, saying that once he was their greatest enemy, but now he's their fiercest ally. People can change, and Gilak agrees, because clearly Hakoda has changed. Hakoda versus Gilak begins. A couple swipes and a kick from Hakoda, so the fight is over. No, wait, he's still going? This guy can withstand one kick? He's the hardiest fighter in the entire Avatar universe. But Hakoda bonks him on the arm, and he's like, ow, god, man, that hurt. Hakoda tries to bring up an old war story to get through to his former brother in arms, but Gilak's not buying it. And oh god, he's been killed! And I know I say that a lot as a joke, but like, no, he got him, for real. Everyone's like, whoa! And Katara and Ang get here just in time to see Hakoda be stabbed, but not in time to stop it. Classic. Everyone sees Katara on the scene with a freshly stabbed father, and they're like, oh god, run! Ang does the you don't get to play anymore earthbending move, and across like 0.75 panels, these guys are caught and tied up, I guess. More importantly, Hakoda is on the ground, presumably bleeding to death. But luckily, on the next page, it's shown that he's only been stabbed in the vague side, which in media is never lethal ever. So as Katara takes to healing him, I get the feeling he's gonna be alright. They go 
got him back to Grand Grand's igloo, it seems, and oh yeah, he's awake. Takes more than one stabbing to take down Hakoda. That much should have been clear from the start. Paku and Grand Grand will look after him too, so we're good. We're chilling. Grand Grand comes up and says that them coming to her hut two days in a row isn't good, referring back to when she had to look after Melina as well. Wait, is Grand Grand like the local doctor? Now that I think about it, it makes sense. Katara mentions in the Serpent's past that she helped Grand Grand deliver babies, and Yugoda in the North remembers that her and Grand Grand were good friends. Maybe they did some schooling together. Huh, never thought of that. Grand Grand tries to give them some sage wisdom, saying that wrong actions come from wrong beliefs, so someone needs to change their beliefs. And it sails right over Katara and Sokka's heads that Grand Grand is in fact talking about them, and not Gilak or Melina and Malik. In fact, the debate between who was truly wrong in that situation actually gets pretty heated between Katara and Sokka. Katara is now against even pulling the oil out of the ground at all, and Sokka continues to argue the point he's been arguing since the rift, that any progress is good progress. But Katara says progress that makes us forget who we are isn't progress. So we update Aang and Toph. Yeah, Hakoda's gonna be alright, but Melina shows up too. I mean, that is her boyfriend that just got gored. She tries to explain to Katara that she doesn't side with Malik at all, but Katara isn't upset about that. Katara's mad at the fact that she ever thought like that. She asks, what if you fall out of love with my dad? You're just gonna go back to thinking like that? But Melina relents. She says she's just here to say goodbye to Hakoda before her and all of her people leave the South Pole in the morning. And Hakoda wants to see her too, according to Grand Grand, so I guess Katara takes the L on that little conversation. Shot of the outside of a prison. Shot of the inside of a prison. Shot of Gilak inside the inside of the outside of that prison. The female warrior that was helping Hakoda at the start of the chapter is bringing Gilak his food, and she tells him his speech he gave, it made a lot of sense. It turns out that big spectacle he pulled wasn't a total failure after all. Gilak got them thinking, and people close enough to be within Hakoda's inner circle are now starting to turn on him. And that's where this one ends. This one was probably the most laser-focused issue of any of the comics so far. It was really just the couple scenes before the festival with Hakoda and then the factory, and then like actually 65 pages of the festival, and then the short scene at the hut, and then Gilak getting the key. So it was like one event. It was almost paced like an episode of the show. Does that translate well to a comic? No, I don't think so. Despite it being so laser focused, there wasn't a lot of meat on the bone. The Malik revelation was interesting, I guess, and I really like Katara's conversation with her dad, but like even Hakoda being stabbed doesn't seem like it's gonna have any meaningful effect on anything. It felt like we were retreading a lot of stuff from the last chapter, but you could tell it's setting up the unrest of the entire tribe in chapter 3. All of the stuff from chapter 1 had to be brought into the eyes of the public in chapter 2 so we can have a finale in chapter chapter 3. So I can see it going well, but I think it'll have to go, like, really well for me to like it, I think. I like how much attention Katara is getting. I really like that she was working on cutting Melina some slack in the middle there, but after all of her fears were confirmed, she's colder than ever to her. And after her fears were confirmed, she's more outwardly emotional about her views on things, even yelling at Sokka that one time. That feels earned. The buildup was pretty good. Other than Katara, no one else really gets any character work. They're just there, being themselves, which is fine. I like these characters. But chapter 3 is really gonna have to wow me for me to say this book is really any good. Patreon shoutouts, if you want to see two brand new videos from me, you can support me on Patreon for just a few bucks. Link, as always, is in the description below the video. Agent Rhino, who got a blister on their heel once and had it laminated so it would never go away. That's how tough they are. Danger Stranger, who is the reason they don't use the electric chair anymore. It simply wasn't strong enough. Gift Misher Von PTA, who did that egg drop experiment in high school and simply caught the egg at the bottom after they dropped it. Omega Fighter, who created a very tasteful flower arrangement for his flea market table and it helped sell almost all of the accursed Eldritch Rune cover tomes he was selling. Sean Martin, who can do one of those breakdancing head spins, but for some reason his RPM doesn't go down, it only goes up exponentially, and science is baffled. Stephanie Riches, who completely outfoxed a polar bear in a blizzard by powerbombing it into a pile of fluorescent tube light bulbs. Thomas Lautenbach, who sees in Synthwave and can hear the god of synth. He is the synth seer. Tiago Nascimento, who can't help but capture a cryptid in every single picture he takes with his iPhone 4. Tis Just Lee, who went to a warehouse rave, and I took a census, and they were the best looking person in Shutter Shades ever recorded. Varunda, who gets the Final Fantasy fanfare every time they eat something healthy. And Whitrow, who's the reason anyone ever thought to draw and quarter anybody, but unfortunately for them, this just created three more Whitrows when they were all done regenerating. And of course, my god overanalyzers, Two Boots Are Beat, Alex Rodriguez Flores, Andrew Watrett, Austin Gallup, Daniel Anderson, Devoted221, Dizzy Payne, Dominic Saint, Distant, Aaron Grace, It's Carton, Jackson, John Ajaka, Justin Fletchall, Mr. Freeze, Nate Clone, Nicholas Abbott, Peter Bayron, Phil, Pogger White, Reese, Rocket Mist, Ryan Maxwell, Samuel Vanderplatz, Super Snipper, Turt Bobs, and some sort of bear face. Next up, finish it.